Welcome to the Lift Your Story podcast with guest Catherine Canty, leadership coach and consultant. Hi everyone, I'm Laurieann. I am that gal from Milton, Ontario, Canada, and I'm with. I am that guy. I am Roy Miller from Dallas, Texas. Welcome to our Lift Your Story podcast. In this episode, we're pleased to have Catherine Canty, and she's a leadership coach and consultant. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you both for having me. I'm excited to be able to share my story with you. Great. Well, well, I see you're a connector, a networker, and a collaborator. It makes it interesting, doesn't it? <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about that? Because we're, Lori and I are, are big on those, all those things as well. And tell us about how that affects your a person's business. Yeah, I think um, networking is, is vital, especially today, um, especially as we're coming out of this post-COVID world. What's this going to look like? And it, a lot of it's going to tie back into how kind were we to our network and uh, how did we help others before we helped ourselves? And uh, as I transitioned from a corporate career of over 20 years, um, when I transitioned onto my own about two years ago, it's my network that's been able to support me. And uh, even when I was within that corporate environment and even in my own community, collaboration is vital. And collaboration allows us to break down those silos that tend to happen just over years. And um, it happens um, with staff that's been in place for a while or new staff that's coming in and they don't know maybe the history and maybe a silo comes up. And um, it, I think it's our job as uh, collaborators to find the like items between the two silos and uh, begin to kind of experiment and figure out how to break down some of those walls. So um, collaboration can come in many different forms. It's not just at work, but, but also in the community. It can be, you know, even in your church setting, it can be within your family. You know, everybody's got different stereotypes just within the family and uh, the holidays roll around and we're kind of like, oh, you know, I'm just going to stand in the corner over here and just talk to the same people as always. And uh, it takes courage to be able to, to stand up and uh, go across that room, whether it's a family reunion or whether it's a corporate event and uh, be willing to be vulnerable and be willing to collaborate with other people that may have a different opinion than yourself. So um, networking, collaborating, all of that good stuff. It's just, it's so important. And I think it's more important today than ever. I believe that. Do you feel that within COVID, because I, I know I went from, uh, I guess my employment ended at the time that COVID started. So uh, but what's interesting is that I reconnected with a lot of my network during this time of COVID, people that I'd spoken to, you know, for years, I knew them, and then all of a sudden, we disconnected for about 10 years, which, of course, helped with the podcast as well, but in a lot of other ways as well. Do you find that people are reconnecting that way because uh, more so now at this point? I think there are people that, that want to give in this world, and those are the people who are going to continue to be successful, and they support one another, and it's easy for us to be bogged down with some of this negativity and, and folks who don't want to build us up, and when we haven't um, been around some of these folks and we can still get back into their lives and still connect with them and share and provide value, there's gold in there. And these are the people that we want to work with. And these are the people that we need to focus on, uh, build them up because they're going to build you up if they're willing to take your call after 10 years. Um, I've got some of my best folks in my network I could call right now and we could jump on the line and maybe we haven't talked for three years, but we would just pick up the conversation. They could troubleshoot whatever issues I was having. And um, I value their opinion. I value their time. And I feel like they do the same with me. And when you find those connections within your network, it's just, it's so important to um, just, you know, continue to remember them. And, and even when you think about them, just shoot them a note. I love just to just drop a note and say, Hey, I saw X, Y, Z driving down the road and it made me think about our trip. And actually I did that with my last um, legal counsel. We used to travel a good bit to uh, rural communities. And when you're going to a rural community, you spend a lot of time in a car. And so we would just have these great conversations. And I ran across an article about something we talked about three years ago in the car and I forwarded it to her, haven't talked to her in two years, and just said, remember when we were driving around in Ohio and we were talking about this? And, you know, I just saw this and I thought about you. And so we just reconnected. It wasn't like anything major, but it was just, you know, hey, I'm thinking about you. I remember our trips. It was a lot of fun. And, and I just, you know, appreciate the relationship. So, yeah, I, I think when, when folks are willing to continue the conversation, even though we haven't been present, that those are just good people to stay in touch with. 
Well, speaking of rural, tell us about your broadband $12.1 million. Yeah, that's fun. So um, that that is um, just being curious, leaning into what the curiosity is and having to trust the fact that we may not have a solution at the end of that conversation, but they may give us just a little bit more of a tidbit that's going to take us to the next conversation and celebrating the wins along the way. So that entire process probably took a couple of years. And, you know, a lot of people like to think, oh, you just got lucky and, and caught a caught a unicorn and made something happen. And as we all know, if we've ever been successful in anything, we all know that we just don't get lucky and catch the unicorn. There's a lot of work that goes in. And when I was in agricultural banking, a finance company, um, I went out to rural communities and learned about the talented people that are across this world that are in rural communities, and they're not just in the metro areas. And these are the folks that are feeding us and um, keeping keeping food in our in our stomachs and fiber on our backs and and keeping us you know happy. And I see all this talent that's sitting there, and I realize that we're creating technology back in the the metro office, and realizing it's great stuff, but they can't use it because they don't have broadband and uh, identifying where these broadband gaps are is kind of like 100 years ago when we had kerosene lanterns in the house and we're having to switch over to electricity. So um, it only was a hundred years ago when we started doing that. And so we're, we're doing it again today. And um, I learned, you know, I I just know in my community that we have broadband gaps and um, I live in a smaller community south of um, Charlotte, North Carolina. And so as I explored this, I just got curious. And there was a lunch and learn at the bank one day. And he, the speaker taught me about vertical assets. And it's just stuff that goes into the air. And you learn that you can sell real estate, um, water tower, grain bins, you know, whatever it may be. And that's how you can get broadband out into these rural communities. And so these rural agricultural communities, they have this stuff. And uh, as we talked, I just kind of planted the seed with them. Hey, can you map my community? And a couple months later, we just followed up much like what you just said, Lori. And, you know, you touch base with people just periodically. And, and so a couple months later, I said, Hey, um, I love that lunch and learn that you did, you know, lead with value. You know, you just, you really helped me understand what a vertical asset is. And I've been out teaching other people that, that this is like real estate. And um, so I was just kind of cheering them on with that. And I said, Hey, how's the mapping? He said, Oh my gosh, you know, I happen to run just a trial map and you guys got a lot of gaps. And I said, perfect. You know, we got proof. And so I said, what do we do? And he said, well, we've got to figure out if you've got a provider friendly community. And so that entailed bringing together the school district. So the the kindergarten through the 12th grade um, administration for that, Um, the agricultural community, the healthcare community, because that impacts telehealth, and then also workforce development and the technical colleges. So I called a few people and and pulled them into a room and I'm going to oversimplify, but I I asked one question that I felt confident that they could agree on despite their backgrounds and differences. And that is, do you believe that we need reliable broadband for the future of our community? And um, fortunately, they could all agree on that. And then I actually cold called on the only telecommunication provider that we had available to us that could respond to this federal grant from the United States Department of Agriculture. And I said, you don't know me, but we've got a community that's ready to support you if you are willing to take the chance to put all these resources in and and submit a bid. And so they had to hire a number of consultants. And little did I know they were actually going through a merger at this time and none of that could be announced. (laughs) So they, they trusted us. We trusted them. And we had community meetings. We delegated things out. We got letters from the community to be able to get the points for the RFP request for proposal. And we were one of three communities um, in South Carolina that was awarded an investment. And it was a $600 million total investment for the country. And you know, they do one announcement at a time for obvious PR reasons. They're not going to an- announce it all at one time. So, uh, of course, we're at the very tail end of the list. We're the only ones in South Carolina who received the pure grant. So we didn't have to loan. This was just a pure federal grant that came into us. And it totaled $12.1 million. 
Uh, Three million of it needed to come from the telecommunication provider to show good faith, and the remainder of it came from the United States Department of Agriculture. And as a result, we're going to have 256 miles of fiber that's going to go out into our community to help close the broadband gap. And uh, it's pretty exciting to drive down the road and you see the trucks out there. And um, I mean, I can literally pull up a voicemail on my cell phone and there's a lady in an agricultural area. She's a vet, large animal vet. And she sends me voicemails and she says, I see the trucks. I see them. They're coming. And then she calls me back. She's like, they're digging the ditch. It's coming down the road. And then she'll call me. She's like, they're hooking it up next week. And then she got me another message. She's like, I have broadband. So I mean, it's like pretty exciting. You get to hear these people so excited just to connect to the darn internet. You know, it's the little things in life. So um, it's, it's been a fun um, experience. And um, if there's lessons learned in there that we can share with others to, um, to be able to help other communities, then I think that's what it's all about. So it's been, it's been a great experience, a lot of fun. You know, we were talking about vertical assets. I was in construction and, and uh, there's a building downtown Dallas. It's about, I don't know, 40 something stories, but, but anyway, so they, they were more, normally you'll run the pipe, the wire from point A to point B, you're done, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, so they were wanting to expand. And so what they did, they took out a couple of elevators in this building and they ran all the conduit and wire and all the communication stuff in the elevators, which is no big deal other than losing elevators. But what was interesting to me is they charged a monthly fee on all that pipe and wire, you know, so much a month per foot, you know, per conduit. And, uh, and, and I guess in that particular building anyway, that was kind of the trend for this particular, because it was a communication and uh, uh, ended up being like a more of a communication hub for a international uh, TV radio station, but regardless. And I think that's pretty interesting is, you know, that they would actually charge rent, uh, so to speak, on that pipe and wire that is all over the building that they don't charge for otherwise. Yeah, it's real estate. It's out there, and 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 if if you have a service that people are willing to pay for, isn't that the way <laughs> to create a business? <laughs> yeah, well, you can ease the struggling moment, and the struggling moment right now is broadband. So yeah, that's mm-hmm. awesome. So, like I said, I was in construction, and so I'm intrigued by your story about the building inspector. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> Yeah, so I've flipped houses with my husband. So I've 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 always traveled sixty percent of the time, and um, it's it's it was fun. So I just would leave a list, and I can design like put me inside of a box, and I can figure out how to maximize a floor plan for today's work, and like today's work environment. So I've done that with a number of mill houses. I've done them for other homes that we've bought over the years, and so you know we just have always done this, and so I've just. I guess have that experience and we are renovating a commercial block right now in our small town and that means a lot of building inspections and then um, we are also um, we do a lot of work with United Way which supports um, the one avenue of it is called New Dam Mill which actually supports women and children in getting them from homelessness into permanent housing and they have a 95 percent success rate and we um actually our honorary chairs of their black tie event to help create funding for the programs that they have. And as part of that, I wanted to actually go see where the the women and children are living. And, and part of this is this house with a couple of cottages were donated. And when they were donated, they're already in bad shape. And so now we're looking at it and we're like, all right, so as a community, we need to come together and slowly begin to tear down one cottage and build back another. So um, in this instance, we've already torn down one of the cottages and we're in the process of, of building it back hopefully once lumber and, and things kind of settle down a little bit. So, um, but in order to, to prepare for this stuff, like I need to start talking with the building inspector. And then um, I'm also on the hospital board and we just purchased a um, huge plantation home, turn of the century, gorgeous home that needs renovating. And it's on 65 acres and we're going to put an assisted living facility out there. You'll have the, the main house, which is just kind of going to be a meeting area. But then off to the side, you'll have 125 beds for assisted and assisted living and long-term care type 
So again, that's the building inspector. And I guess people just know that I've done enough building that I'm, I'm on this committee. So, you know, I can renovate an old house. So what's an old plantation home? Not a big deal. So, um, but when you look at it, you got to start thinking about sprinkler systems and, and water pumps and fire routes and like all this good stuff. So I've got multiple projects that are taking place around town. And I feel like this poor building inspector is looking at me and just shaking his head like, good God, woman, how many times are you going to call me a day? And um, so between him and the fire marshal, I feel like they've, um, they've been living with me lately, just kind of over in my main construction site. And um, I'm scared if I push the envelope too much, he's just going to shoot me or, or, you know, shut me down. <laughs> Those two people have a lot of power. They do. They have a whole lot of power. And I tell you what, they actually, they have been very patient with me and they're working with me and um it just as a, as a woman that needs three fire doors in this environment right now, um, I'm able to get the fire doors, thank God, because of my network, because otherwise I couldn't put in, you know, big commercial order for that kind of stuff. So that's where your network and collaboration really come back in is, is my network is helping me get these three things that I didn't think was going to be that darn hard, but you can't get it at Lowe's. And uh, the collaboration that you need between all these people that are showing up to work with your fingers crossed that you get your plumber, your HVAC, um, your internet provider, they've got to run all their conduit. Um, you know, you've got the general contracting stuff that's going on. So collaboration is, is totally in this project. So it's been fun. Yeah, it's, it's funny. People that aren't involved in construction, they think, Everything is at home, home Depot or Lowe's, you know, <laughs> and, and it's construction, uh, commercial is totally different yeah. than residential, you know, and yes. it's hard to tell people, they go, well, just go down to Home Depot and get those light fixtures. Well, uh, if they were there, I would, but I can't. They make them when you order them, you know. Yes, it's, yes. It's, you know, and, and everything's just not down at Home Depot. No, no, it's not. And um, yeah, they don't have it all down there. And I love... I love these folks that are working with me because I'll, you know, you come in when you think you know what the plan is and that's like a good start. And that's just like a life lesson. Like we're just going to come in and here's like the preliminary plan, but then things, you know, if you've got to be flexible, if you're going to succeed through this stuff. So you're going to zig and zag a little bit and where we thought the firewall was going to be, and I was going to need four doors. Now we're going to move the firewall and we're going to have three doors and that's going to help save a little bit of money, which is great. But now I've got to like recommunicate it to everybody else who's doing the wiring and the impact that goes with it. So um, it's entertaining if nothing else, but yeah, as, as an electrician and, and commercial work that you have in your background, I can only imagine the stories that you have to share. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I told an architect one time we were doing a church and, uh, they were cutting in a, a door in a wall. Of course there was a uh, flex running through it. And I mm -hmm. and he said, I, I, who, who would have known? I said, look, Carl, no matter what you do in a job, no matter what you do, it's going to affect the electrical. Yeah. Might as well just figure it. Yeah. It's going to affect the electrical. We're the first ones on the job, last ones to leave. Yes. For that yes. Very and I'm and I'm grateful for it too because I just <laughs> met with my electrician this afternoon and I said we got a lot of work to do and it's already like there's huge progress because he had to rip out wires that are 70 years old. We don't need this stuff anymore. But I don't know what's live and what's not live. And um, and now we've finally gotten to the point where we've got it all ripped out and they're like taking out armfuls of just cords that nobody needs it, but they were important back 20 years yeah. ago when we needed this stuff, but we don't need phone lines and um, everything that, that we needed to support it. So it's fun. Yeah. So do you do coaching? I do leadership coaching. So it's a little bit different than life coaching. I, I'm not much of a therapist, but I'm more about getting <laughs> results and helping uh, managers turn into leaders. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so to start off, um, to start off, if you look at the space bar on your keyboard to the left and to the right are two little buttons and it's an ALT, ask, listen, thank. And that's kind of how we get started with leadership coaching. Um, and and coaching's not for everybody, as we all know. Um, you gotta have courage and discipline and humility to be able to, to be coached. And first step is, are you willing to be coached? Do you have the courage and the discipline and the humility to go through this? And um, we, we focus on building people up 
and uh, and helping people um, grow and, and continue to um, advance their careers. So it is all about future-based and, and building people up. And so it starts with asking. And I love this simple question, you know, how can I become a better communicator at the next meeting? Or how can I delegate better in the future? And so we're building people up and we're, we're, we're making this, um, um, you know, future focused and you don't feel like you're tearing people down based off what they did in the past. So you ask, the leader needs to listen to what actually was, um, was shared with them. Don't argue and don't tell them that those were terrible ideas that you already tried. Uh, so listen. And last thing is just to say thank you. And you don't want to promise anything. So many people like to promise. And so this, this process of leadership coaching starts with the ALT, ask, listen, thank. But really to be able to drive that perception and your own personal change and also the perception of your change, it's through consistent follow-up back to the, to the individuals that you're, that you have your, your peers and your stakeholders. And, um, and you figure out that, you know, I'm going to go back and follow up and I'm going to share what did I, what did I try, what happened and what am I willing to do going forward? So, um, it's a, it's a leadership process. That's been a lot of fun, um, of all the clients that I've worked with over the past year. Um, they've all been able to create measured success because the stakeholders actually come back and rate whether or not the individual improved or not. And, uh, it's over a, usually a six month course. And, um, it's been exciting to see the hard work that these leaders are putting in to uh, choose to be recognized. And um, I'm just, I'm proud of, of the work that they're doing. You know, you say listening and that is really a skill. Yeah. I mean, people think, oh yeah, I heard it, I heard it. Yeah, no, no, listening is a very hard skill to learn. Yeah. An important one though. You know, you can learn so much good information when you just listen and, uh, I feel like Lorianne, I feel like you're, you're learning so much. So you're, you're being an excellent listener. <laughs> and I tend to blink a lot too, when I'm taking things in, I was watching one of these podcasts and I'm like, wow, do I blink? And it's only when, when I'm talking, I don't blink so much when I'm listening. Yeah. But, you're um, just focused. Yeah. It's, uh, but it, it's, it's also so interesting. I mean, the coaching and, and you're right, the listening and, um, you know, I have been guilty of not listening well enough, but I'm a lot more aware of it. And I think that that's the first place you start, is being aware. Yeah, and, and, and being being able to have that courage to, to say, you know, maybe maybe I can get a little bit better. And really, you know, the folks that we're working with, these are already high potential people. They're high performing people. And um, it's a little bit different than some other coaching where you're trying to like bring people back in and, and have a plan of last resort. These are folks that, you know, you can teach them the day-to-day -day stuff, but as a leader within an organization, we need to know how are they going to adjust their leadership style to support their new role as a CEO or a CFO, and how are they going to learn to really let go? Because as, as we've all learned, when you climb up through organizations, you do less and less, and you sit in more and more meetings, and you're supposed to get more done by doing less work, <laughs> and um, that listening is really important. I totally agree. Yeah, totally agree. <laughs> yeah, you well, worry more because they're not doing it the way that you remember doing it or the yeah, way that you want yeah. it done. And that's very Oh, awesome. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, um, a lot of sessions are about that. They're not doing it the way I used to do it. I'm like, but oh. did it get done? Yeah. And in half the time too, probably. <laughs> yeah. I, I worked for a guy. He was, he, we needed to change, but he wouldn't change because he was afraid if he did something that didn't work, corporate would call him on it, mm. you know? So he just figured we'd just go with it. Yeah. yeah. We got, you know, I'm noticing we're just not empowering people like we should. And um, there's just that comfort of, of staying in this, in this box. And um, gosh, I was walking into Walmart last week and there's an elderly man. He's not wearing a mask, even though we're still supposed to be wearing masks. And he's trying to get into Walmart, probably just to get a prescription, can't breathe hardly anyway, he's hunched over. And the lady, the greeter is just all about, you got to put a mask on, you got to put a mask on. I'm like, the guy can't hardly breathe. And I know when you look at it from her perspective, the greeter, she's been told everyone must wear a mask. And so like, that's what she's been told to do. But yet you've got to have a little bit of empowerment and some wiggle room in there to allow someone to make that decision and feel empowered to, to be able to, 
to make the right decision for the customer experience and, and just that overall empathy of other people and what they're going through. Yeah. Something that people forget about sometimes. Yeah. 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 Catherine, how can our listeners reach out to you? I have a website and it is katherinecanty.com. It's spelled with a C. And then also you can find me at LinkedIn under the name Catherine Canty, and then that can loop you back to my website. Cool. Great. Thank you so much for this, so much for the, the great stories. I just love it. Yeah. And uh, going back, I just quickly, for me, I owned an auto repair shop. And for me, one of the things I had to deal with, with that was I wanted to do an impound and it was specific how the gate had to be, how wide it had to be, how far it had to be and everything. I'm like, really? It's just an impound where I want to put cars. I know. <laughs> but it gets that, that detailed. So yeah. uh, you have a lot of patience with all that you're doing. So congratulations on all this. Thank you, Lori. And I've, I've just love your, you, both of your backgrounds are so fun and extensive and uh, looks like you're not afraid of risk, either one of you. So um, <laughs> it's a gift to be able to, to sit here and, and be able to chat with you both. So thank you, Lori. And thank you, Roy. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure meeting you. Absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to visit us at lifterstory.com.